And now on to our featured interview today. I have Rami Deeb with us from Talkwalker. He's speaking to us, well, me, live from Luxembourg, one of my favorite places on the planet. Rami, welcome to Fuse. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, yeah, we should welcome you here sometime if you ever visit Luxembourg. It's, uh, the, the, the weather is a bit crazy, but I'm sure that you'd love it. <laughs> For anyone who hasn't made the journey to Luxembourg, um, and, and some people might go, well, why would you go there? It's like there is culturally so much here. There's so much history. Um, the catacombs, the, the um, uh, frankly, the, uh, the, the bar the scene is very cool. The art galleries, just everything is just so beautifully cool. And there's one of my favorite Mexican restaurants down in the center of town as well. So, Rami, on to the important <laughs> things. We're talking about being customer centric and and when this came across my desk i was very intrigued about this because as someone who's been in comms uh, since the 90s i've always looked at it from the point of view of understand your audience understand the need within your audience and maybe this is because i have a broadcast background but but unless you scratch the itch and and address their need then they're, they're not going to be interested they're not going to care um is there a sense that maybe people lost their way and they were just pushing lots of material as we got into this digital world and we maybe need to rebalance it back to what are the needs of the audience and how do we know what their needs are? First of all, thanks for giving a bit of a historic context, telling me about your um, your background in comms. Actually, you were a bit, you touched upon it, but not quite. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the early 2000s, companies were and startups mostly were mostly focused on uh, being uh, product driven. So they were trying to develop a lot of uh, cool tech. They were trying to build this, uh, you know, ride this wave of, uh, you know, uh, World Wide Web, trying to build some new solutions on these technologies. And moving forward, kind of with more data being available, um, these companies kind of shifted towards becoming more data driven. So you see a lot of the com companies adopting a data first mindset where they're just following the data blindly, kind of adapting their strategies accordingly. And kind of that worked for a while, obviously to acquire new you know, customers, to attract new, to, to assess the competition, to gauge the market, to do all these sort of due diligence. However, nowadays we, uh, we have a new contract with the customer. So brands need to rethink their, um, their social or their, you know, their, "Quote unquote contract with 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 their consumer. Basically, the consumer nowadays have the authority and have a different set of expectations from brands. So what that really means, and it's been going for quite a while, because I know people talk about like COVID kind of shifted everything. No, it's been going for quite some time, at least for the past five, six, seven years. Um, so when we talk about customer centricity, it really is all about you know, believe it or not, it's all about empathy. It's all about putting yourself in their shoes. And the sooner you realize that, the better and the more um, sustainable you become. So we're not thinking short-term wins, but long-term uh, wins. Basically, you have brand loyalty, brand love, which we have recently re uh, published a report about. You have people becoming much more uh, trusting towards the brand. So trust and uh, transparency are go long way. Uh, you don't want someone just to buy from you once and then forget about you. You want someone to advocate on your behalf, to become your brand ambassador, to become much more comfortable. And when I say, um, and going back to the point of empathy, is really understanding your customer, not just uh, looking at um, you know at their purchase behavior or looking at their browsing behavior, but really um, get intelligence. So moving away from novelty metrics to a holistic intelligence uh, framework. So whether that was through social um, social and listening or um, market research or looking at um, you know, any competitor analysis, what they're doing on reviews, how they're interacting with your brand, if they have any concerns. And that, and that, and that is not just from a perspective of, uh, you know, doing uh, the, the new stuff, but also going back to the classical way of doing the, like, you know, focus groups sometimes. People tend to forget that, like, sometimes these, these um, arenas or these um, channels provide you with direct insights. And um, moving forward, you know, it's... It, it, once you have this information, you have all this amount of data, you, you applied it to artificial intelligence and you have these um, you know, processes happening, um, it just is crucial to design the experience around the customer centric. So, and customer centricity is not just a matter of marketing or comms. 
it's not a matter of uh, limiting yourself to those aspects. It's actually on all touch points. So it could be from product development. They need to know how the customers, because what when you talk to someone like who's, who's working quality assurance or you know product development, the product works, but does it work for the customer? That is a very critical detail that is sometimes forgotten in the day-to-day -day business. And it goes on every level of like customer support, uh, you know, business development, uh, on sales, uh, because you know all, you have all these salespeople trying to adapt the, their pitches, but they don't particularly know how the consumer really uses it on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. And that feedback cycle is um, ongoing and constantly shifting. So once you have these uh, feedback um, going, it's like you're involving the customer at every decision being made in the company, marketing, sales, business development, uh, everything, as you mentioned, like, you know, it, it could be as, as, as dull as, you know, if you're, you're working in media, um, it could be as them helping you choose the cover for your magazine. I don't know. I'm just giving a random example. And you, you see a lot of those brands uh, that are out there. Like, for example, one of, one of the very major global coffee, um, coffee shop chains, they did that brilliantly. And I always like to give that example uh, of um, they, they gave the customer their time back. So by joining their loyalty program, uh, you, you'd be getting your customized drink on time, on the go. Uh, I'm, I, I think you know who I'm talking about, but uh, this is just a very micro, uh, a micro decision that is driven by the consumer, believe it or not. And it, uh, it goes to airlines, it goes to any sort of industry, even cars. You, you, you'd be surprised just how these you know, industries that you'd assume that they're done by engineers somewhere in Germany or somewhere in the US or in Japan, but actually they're being driven by the consumer. And this is where we're going to in, a, in the next few, three to five years. What do we look at from terms of data points from information that we gather and how do we gather it? In today's real time economy, obviously time is money. You don't have that type of luxury to, to go on one-on-one -on -one basis with, uh, with your end customer. So you need to have a solution that kind of gives you real-time access to real-time feedback to conversations that are ongoing across all these platforms across all these languages so what we've did what we've done is basically take your conversation and and maximize it and kind of stretch it out across the world wide web and happening in real time and you're also leveraging artificial intelligence so you don't need to sit on your computer all day having chit chatting with no you can automate this stuff you can really know what their feedback is and understand their sentiment specifically so uh, one thing that kind of, um, you know, happens in the digital arena is basically nuances get lost in, in language. So when people talk about, for example, memes, you know, you have a lot of the, these memes. Maybe they, they could be a good thing. Maybe they're just celebrating your product. You know, you, you have a lot of these when uh, a new product launch, like when you have a new mobile phone that is huge, for example, or some weird, funny, you know, the Internet, how it works. So this is the type of intelligence that you want to know if you're launching a hardware device or you're launching a new movie, for example. Like You see a lot of those memes popping up or people talking about uh, whether or not they like the certain product they released. Um, you know, Add that to the fact that you are capable of um, you know, reporting and kind of sharing that, uh, that intelligence across your entire organization. That adds a layer of um, you know, breaking down those data silos. Uh, and, and, and here I'm, I'm referring back to your, your example of how you as an IT person were working on this alone. But imagine what would happen if the product development side also knew that feedback or even the, the bank, the Chase Bank people uh, knew about that feedback. So uh, it's, it's about democratizing data. It's about getting real time data, accurate data and, uh, you know, automated data, obviously. Uh, so I hope that answers your question because I feel like mm, people get this um, kind of still are scared about this type of so because it's a it's a, you know it's a bit of a shift from moving away from being a data scientist because marketers and communications and PR people used to think about like data 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 but now you're thinking more like a psychologist you're prioritizing for first party data you're uh, looking at uh, very privacy conscious audience people who are very intelligent you no longer can look at your consumers as a monolith they're they are very much uh, complex they have different needs they have very specific and they know what they want you assume that like for example you see a lot of the SaaS companies you know assuming that oh no this is good for you this is bad for you 
you cannot make those assumptions on scale. You have to really listen to their needs and act upon it and continue moving forward. And we can only expect that uh, moving forward, I, I predict that there should be uh, like a chief customer officer, some like CCO at, at, at those companies. And uh, I could really see it going there. It all goes back to what type of brand image you want to portray to your consumers. So uh, I've recently published an article about brand image specifically about looking at differences between how Allbirds, the shoe, the shoe company, it's all about sustainability. It's all about being, you know, eco-friendly, carbon neutral and whatnot. However, if you compare the Japanese website versus the American website, you see that the American website is more, uh, is more pushing the messaging of being eco-friendly, conscious, and whatnot. However, in the Japanese website, it's more, uh, it's more positioning itself as a young brand, as a cool, hip brand. So, as you mentioned here, like obviously there's local knowledge. However, these nuances obviously need to go through a series of feedback cycles from the consumers and learning more about how and who buys your product and how they consume it. And therefore, you you should be able to make small adjustments and and and, and shift accordingly. So you need to be able to kind of know exactly what you want to test and localize. So you can't really test everything and localize everything all at once. It's an ongoing process and it's a learning curve, as you mentioned. And 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 and, and going back to the idea of being a psychologist, it's, um, it's never a constant thing. So you might have a website that is developed for the, let's say, the, the German market, but different age groups have different landing pages. So if you are going, let's say, now with GDPR and privacy laws going into implementation, you're going back to first-party data. So, for example, when you push out your email marketing strategy, you, for the age group of above, you know, above 40, you send them a, a certain landing page. However, for the uh, for the under, you know, under 21s, you get them a different landing page. So that is one way of customizing and personalizing the experience with your brand and knowing exactly like they're going to like this product or they might not like it, and vice versa. Um, so it's only a matter of testing the ground and continuously adapting. So there's no one thing that you can localize and completely uh, let it sit. And uh, this is the way you should look at it. Customer centricity is a lively thing that, um, you know, that goes on with consumers. And uh, there you go. Time is not always our friend. And I'll, I'll be fair and say it isn't today specifically uh, on this one, Rami. Um, uh, before you leave us, firstly, I'd like people to know where they could get in touch with you. And secondly, it would be remiss of me to ask for your 30 second elevator pitch of the branding that you have behind you. Tell us a bit about your platform. Yes, uh, so TalkWalker is one of the world leading uh, social consumer and market intelligence platforms. Uh, we've been empowering over 2000 brands globally to put the customer at the center of their operations. We have offices all over uh, Frankfurt, Singapore, San Francisco, London, Milan and New York, as well as Luxembourg, our headquarters. Uh, we have uh, we take great pride in our AI powered solutions and uh, we look forward to you know, hearing from you, actually, if you want to, if you want to send me an email at r.d at talkwalker.com, then feel free to do so. Or if you want to just request a free demo, go ahead and uh, hit uh, talkwalker.com. And, um, you know, one of our team members will be happy to support you. I wish you the very best. I hope that Luxembourg is as grand and beautiful as it ever is. And, and by the way, I'm not going to do a piece for uh, Luxembourg tourism, <laughs> but everybody. I mean, seriously, everybody, regardless of where you're watching or listening to this in the world, if there is one place that you need to go, it is Luxembourg. It is, it's truly beautiful and truly fascinating. Uh, Rami, thank you so much for joining us here on Fuse. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.